Welcome to The Vocalist Magazine Presents. I'm your host, Anna. The name Sule Heitner is on a lot of people's lips, as you might remember him as a quarter finalist on the show La Voix. After touring all around the globe for a number of various musicians as a guitarist, he's established himself as a solo act. And whether the song you're listening to has more of a rock, folk, funk, or country sound to it, they all have a few things in common. They radiate originality, rhythm, and Sule's soothing, seductive voice. I must have been like five or six when I said, I want to be a musician. But back then, I probably said, I want to be a rock star. <laughs> but yeah, it just stuck. I, I, I had other interests and other things that I, I considered, but music just kept coming back. There were no professional musicians in my family, but my, my mother was always playing piano, always singing. My dad had a record collection that was really, it was really something. Now that I'm old enough to appreciate it, I look back at some of the things he had in his collection, I was, I, I can be very grateful to have that in my environment. So my sisters all played piano and guitar and that, that had an influence as well. So I'm the baby, I'm the youngest. So I got all the influence from everyone growing up. When, when you tell your parents you wanna play guitar, and in your head, you're imagining, you know, a, an axe-shaped, blood-dripping electric guitar, and they get you a nice classical nylon string and have you sitting like this. It didn't go over that well at first, but I learned to really appreciate it, and yeah, the classical training's there. The repertoire I've long forgotten, but the, the actual training and the, the technique is still there. And what, it, what attracted you to the guitar? It was cool. <laughs> Tribal Groove was interesting because um, I just decided that I was going to go headlong into music and not look back. A leap of faith kind of thing. And uh, Tribal Groove was the, the vehicle with which I was going to do this with. I had written a couple songs and put them out in a little cassette. So that got the band set together so that we can play those songs. But then we started getting shows here and there uh, out in the countryside and, and it started to snowball and grow on its own. But eventually the band went, you know, in different directions. Everyone had a different uh, vision as to what they wanted to do. And uh, it became easier just to, to work as a solo artist. It feels like someone took a knife, baby, edgy and dull And caught a six-inch valley through the middle of my soul um, Now I want to talk about the Montreal Jubilation Gospel Choir. Um, that's something you were part of, and uh, with the choir you got to open for Celine Dion. Yes. So talk to me about the choir and how that influenced you, and of course for opening for Celine Dion, because that's just so cool. Oh, that, that was a pretty <laughs> cool experience. Well, the choir, I kind of joined it as a sort of school if you will. Most of the artists that I really, really admired and, and respected had gone through a gospel experience. People like Curtis Mayfield and so on, Aretha Franklin. Um, and I figured this is a style of music that is not necessarily, as a Canadian, as accessible to me as, as, as stateside. So I figured I have this opportunity. I went and did the audition and uh, great, great experiences. I mean, uh, I, I've learned so much from just those five years. Met great people, and the repertoire itself, just singing gospel. You know, it's, it's transcendent, you know. Some of the gigs we did, for, for example, Celine Dion loved the choir, and she had us, for a few occasions, we sang at her wedding. And 
in front of, you know, the Bell Center. Every kid says, one day, well, one day I'm going to play at the Forum, but there was no Bell Center. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. You see all the reflections of, like, you know, tens of thousands of people's glasses because the lights are reflecting them. And you just see them everywhere. Sometime in the water Sometime This song dedicated to Bad News Brand. Woo! We love you. Sundown, Griffin Town. Don't be found around here. This place can be so cold. Come on. Found your face and down on the cold hard ground. No one heard a sound. No one heard a sound. No one called a soul.
Badness Brown is, is a curious guy because he uh, he started off playing in the, in the subways, and there's a, a, even a documentary out called um, uh, Songs for a Blue Train that features him. Um, he was playing harmonica and uh, basically had the idea to bring the harmonica into hip hop, which a lot of people probably said, not gonna, have, not a great idea, it's not gonna, you know, and he just went headlong, and did what he was gonna do anyways. I remember giving Bad News his first show money in life. You knew him personally? I knew him personally, very personally. I love Bad News Brown. And years ago, I remember going to Saint Hyacinthe. I had this tour and I booked him on the tour. And that first show, I think, was in Saint Hyacinthe. And I remember being in the car. And I remember the pay wasn't all that big. It's a long time ago, but I remember giving him $50. We were sharing maybe $150. And he was like, wow, B, that's my first show money. That's the first time I'm getting paid to perform. And uh, one day, he was, he, unfortunately, he was murdered. He's a contemporary and a colleague of mine, and we had a lot of friends in common. I don't think I could have written a song in like that if he was a close friend of mine, because I think the feelings would be too raw and too too hard to express. But having him be sort of like a friend of friends and someone who I knew and someone who I respected um, kind of allowed me to be a little bit more like, OK, Hi. we can. Hi. Yeah. I'm Sule. Nice to meet you. Sule. Yes. Who plays at the <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you got it. How are you? I'm very good. Why? How are you? What kinds of music do you do? All kinds of music. What? <laughs> what? Why? Yeah. You know what? That's a really good question. I just love making music. It's what I do. Magdalena, you have a beautiful day. You look like you're out here in the sun having a good time. Yeah. Nice cars and fancy digs and deluxe condo towers. The frozen wage got me counting overtime hours. Living paycheck to paycheck can make a life taste so sour. When all I really need is you. All I really need is you. And I find some of your songs, they definitely have a bit of a political edge to them, uh, like Duck and Cover, Drop Your Guns. I guess that songwriting is, the lyrics are important to you. Yeah, yeah, there's a message in what I'm trying to, to do. I think every artist, uh, it's, it's a part of your job. I think it's a duty to, to have a message that you need to get out, whatever that message is, you know? And I think the diversity of what the messages can be is important too, but that's mine. Mine, uh, I don't usually um, talk about the message very much. I really want people to get from the music what I'm trying to say. Sule is just easy to put my vocal, place my vocal on top of his, and just ride whatever he's on to, even in terms of rhythm. Some people are really on time. Being urban, we have that laid back approach. Sometimes the vocals might be a little early, a little late on the beat. And that's more soulful, more hip hop, being more hip hop soul about it. That latency, we call it. I feel the man, I feel the human being. He's a great man. And I only collaborate with people that I think are good people. Because on a stage, if you're not with good people, they're just gigging. Once you fall, nobody's picking you up. They're just laughing and they go to the next gig. When you have good people, nobody falls. It's that chemistry, everybody's backing each other. Oh, I really need. to talk about La Voix, of course. You were a quarter finalist yeah. on the show. Uh, what did you learn from that whole experience? Um, well, unfortunately, one of the things I've, I learned, I think I learned it a little bit before I did La Voix, but it was one of the reasons why I went and did it, is uh, 
our industry has become a little bit of a popularity contest. It's too bad because we all know people who are uber talented and really should be seen by the public who are still in their basements. And, and then we know of other people who are being paid tons of attention who are maybe very, very talented in their own right, but not as talented as the people we know in their basements. And they're like, why, is there, why are they there? And they're there. It's all about popularity. So um, the talent doesn't necessarily get you into the public eye anymore. So being in the public eye gets you in the public eye. It's kind of a, <laughs> a snowball thing. So I figured, you know what, you can either sort of fight against this trend or you can just, you know, suck it up and go with it. And uh, a show like Revoir is a vehicle that allows me to do that, to get uh, seen by millions of people. And uh, at least then, you know, they can at least have an introduction to who I am and what I do. It was a great experience. It's a lot of fun. I can feel it. Yeah. <laughs> Late morning train. I pull up in the pouring rain. Yeah, yeah. Think that everyone could see my pain. Maybe I've opened my brain in a different place on a different plane. Let's do that. Or maybe I'm just getting tired. Tired of the lies and shame. All the lies and shame. Resembling hand It's manipulation. Deceptions like a pretty bubble Eventually it's gonna pop uh -huh. Revealing all the lies and shame All the lies and shame Deceptions and blame It's manipulation game Check it out Gets hurt, even worse. Don't want you know that this relationship is long gone. And bullets coming out your mouth, just leave you dead wrong. Help do what gets you, who more rank effects, so hold on. But if you don't want to move on, then you're gonna need to calm down, calm down. This damn mentality uh -huh. is gone.
Ouais. Je l'avais dans la tête, gros. C'est exactement ça que je pensais. Ouais, ouais, je, après, le beat, il rentre, mais... We spend too much time together, man. Too, for too long. It's starting to be freaky. <laughs> like water, smooth, very on point, precise with his vocals. I'm a lot of energy on stage, very, I don't want to be predictable. I just vibe through the music and just bring ad-libs, rap vocals, and he comes from an urban world also, so he has good rhythms. I love it. I mean, there are so many uh, magical moments when you're on stage with other musicians or uh, when you're writing and you're in the studio and and even just sometimes the feedback and the effect that you have on the public and on people uh, it's so gratifying um, I couldn't think of anything else to do and I have thought of other things to do and I, I haven't come up with one yet it's a nice way to do that instead of the way the original is like instead of me doing the part that you're playing like that's the normal guitar part yeah do it on a bass I, the and i'll just like the so sule you've been a musician in the industry for a long time what are some of the challenges you found uh it's, there's it's a challenging field period uh, I think some of the challenges that uh, that I've come up with is how do you, t first of all, when I was very young, uh, how do you turn your passion and the thing that you love to do, the thing that you're good at, into revenue? How do you make a living out of it? So uh, I went into it with a lot of faith and a lot of ideals. <laughs> I figured everything takes hard work and that if you apply yourself in whatever it is, you're going to find those those ways so I think the challenge is to be able to make your passion into a living and not lose the passion so you have to kind of walk a certain line where you can be the artist you want to be but yet still be able to be uh, a commodity uh, you know our society it's a capitalist one what we do and who we are is a commodity you know it's still a business it is <laughs> And how have you seen the industry change over the years? Well, I think that my career sort of happened in a very tumultuous time in the music industry. I mean, I think it's, it's gonna be changing a lot of industries, but the internet and computer in general really changed how people make music, how people listen to music, buy music, everything. And the business model is completely turned upside down. And it's, it's a difficult thing because if you're, I mean, there are a lot of musicians who backed the, uh, the idea that music should be free um, and, uh, and really got behind it. But uh, if your main product is free, how do you live? <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a quandary and it's something that I think that is trying to be worked out right now. And I think that it's a, the transition has been really gradual, very slow, and I don't think it's actually stopped yet. So where it's going to land is anybody's guess. Five years down the road, I'm hoping to have a, a nice collection of releases that I've done and uh, be able to go out on tours reach more people, especially I love doing the live thing. I love to actually play for people. So hopefully be able to do more of that in venues, um, more like festivals and, and concert halls. I love those kind of venues. In 10 years, probably still doing the same thing, but I'm hoping to get the, uh, the songwriting for, for other artists a little bit more going, you know? I kind of see that as where I want to be in my future. Based on your experiences, what's the biggest piece of advice you would have for musicians? Remember to persevere. Just don't give up. If you really, really have to do this, if, it, if music is what you have to do, um, then just never, ever, ever, ever give up. Shh.